When I was seven years old, both of my mom's kidneys stopped working. At the time, I barely knew what a kidney was, so I tried not to let it bother me. My dad assured me that mom would be okay. Over the course of the next two years, my mom was constantly in and out of the hospital fighting kidney disease. She was undergoing this treatment known as dialysis, where she had to go into the hospital four times a week to have her blood filtered for her by this giant machine because her kidneys could no longer do it. And then we had this machine in our house when she couldn't go to the hospital, that these giant tubes that were connected to her. So in the middle of the night when my five-year-old or four-year-old sister was crying her eyes out, my mom couldn't even go see her. And then I really started to worry because despite my dad's assurances, I did not think that she was going to be okay. And then the doctor said the time was running out. All the assurances that she would be okay were not true, and I really did have reason to worry. And then one day, we got the call. It was the Brigham and Women's Hospital telling my mom that they had a kidney waiting for her and that she needed to be rushed to the hospital in 20 minutes. After probably the fastest drive that my parents have ever done in their life, she was in the hospital, and nine hours later, she had a functioning kidney that replaced her two kidneys of her own that were not working. This was truly a miracle, because people are dying every single day just waiting for a, trans a transplant for kidneys. Actually, 12 people die each day waiting, and 43 million Americans are affected by this horrible disease. But at the time, I was only nine. So I wasn't thinking about the long-term effects of kidney disease on our country. I was just thinking about having mom back and having her able to drive me to my after-school activities and cook for me and cook me all the Greek foods that I loved. <laughs> but throughout, high, throughout, throughout middle school, I started to develop this interest in science. And I really, I, I started doing after-school computer science classes, which I could do because my mom was there to be able to take me to this, these things because she had this transplant. And I started getting into science fairs and research. And in eighth grade, I did a simple science fair project that was related to skiing because I was, that's another thing that I do. I'm really into skiing <laughs> other than science. But then when I got to high school, I wanted to combine this really strong interest I had in skiing with something I really, really cared about, which was my mom and kidney disease. And so I combined these two things together, and I went to my mom and I said, Mom, let's do kidney disease research on our kitchen countertop. <laughs> and needless to say, my mom wasn't too excited about that because the last science experiment, we actually had a chemical that spilled on our kitchen countertop and there was a stain for that probably still to this day. <laughs> so I had to find a lab to work in. And I sent over 100 different emails to professors in the Boston, Portland, and any area within an hour and a half of our house because that's as far as my mom was willing to drive me. <laughs> Which she could do because she had this transplant. And finally, after 99 rejections, I got one maybe. And I, I, I made sure to turn that into a yes, <laughs> because this is my only hope. So I went in, I was this kind of 15-year-old, a little, little shorter than I am now, walking into this lab at Harvard Medical School in Dr. Joseph Benventry's lab. And I sat down with him and I told him I, that week I'd watched this science fiction thing about, or it wasn't, now it's becoming a reality, but people had been able to print an organ in the lab. They'd be, been able to 3D print a heart, which was just, to me, so futuristic, but they'd been doing it. And I asked him, why can't we do that with kidneys? Why can't we grow kidneys in the lab and then give them back to my mom or the patient that's suffering from the disease? And he said, we're actually working on that right now. And I said, well... I, I want to be a part of it. I want to join in too. Count me in. <laughs> I want to 3D print organs. <laughs> and so I started on a year-long journey to get there. And after countless long, long hours in the lab, probably 10 hours a day in, for 10 weeks in the summer, probably more, <laughs> I finally had managed to generate kidney cells from patient cells. And I did this by simply taking skin cells from a patient I could turn them into stem cells. And these stem cells can become anything in the body. And as I quickly found out in the summer, they can become anything in the body, but they will become everything that you don't want to, be, to become. Because every day, I would check that Petri dish, and I'd get hearts. 
and nervous tissue and pancreases, all these weird cells. <laughs> but finally, at the end of the summer, I'd managed to get the kidney cells I needed from these stem cells. And I'd built on previous work in the lab to really t- fine-tune my method that took 19 days. But this was only halfway to the solution. Because it's one thing to have kidney cells, but it's a totally different story to have those kidney cells organized in the very specific way that they are in a real kidney. But the summer had run out, and there was no way that I was going to be able to continue my research in Boston while I was going to school in Bethel, Maine. So I started sending more emails. I sent emails to people all over the eastern, in Maine specifically, in the western United States, trying to secure the funding and donations I needed to set up a college-level research lab at Gould Academy. And after three months of countless emails and more rejections and failures, I finally succeeded. So I went back in the lab. I had my lab set up at Gould, and I, I was able to take my kidney cells and combine them with a 3D structure. And I looked to the mouse for this, because the mouse kidney already has this same structure that you need in a kidney. And I, you can think of it kind of as a backpack. You have the mouse that has all the mouse cells in it, and you have the, the backpack kind of gives the structure. And I take all the mouse cells out, and I put my kidney cells that I derived from the patient in instead. And I let them grow together for four days. And those four days felt longer than those 11 months that I waited for my mom to receive her kidney transplant. And finally, at the end of those four days, I walked into the lab, I put my two eyes through that giant microscope, and I looked, and what I saw was truly remarkable. Not only had the cells been able to integrate into this mouse structure and survive, but they also been able to form 3D units that could potentially produce urine in mice and someday in humans to save my mom's life or the millions of other Americans that are suffering from kidney disease. But here's the thing. I'm no genius. I just refuse to believe that the status quo is good enough. My mom's illness told me that rejection is everywhere, that failure is a constant threat. But it also taught me that passion and perseverance can overcome anything. And that's the real miracle. Thank you.